the way that we decided to define the coordinate system for this year, and I'd like to try and keep it the same for all the following years unless something crazy happens, is that the x direction is going to be in the direction of the length of the field. So let's see if I can draw here. So that direction is x. And then the y direction is along the, the width, the shorter portion of the field. And so if you are the, so this is the blue side. Oops, I can't draw a B here. This is the blue side. Your zero, zero coordinate is right here. So the origin of your coordinate system is here. Um, and so the goal that you're trying to score in is, I think it works out, it's like, I don't know, 40 inches or something in the y direction and 600 inches or something in the x direction, about those kinds of values. So um, the reason we decided to do this is that in most FRC games, the scoring objective requires you to sort of drive across the distance of the field. And so you tend to be pointed along the length of the field when you start autonomous either forwards or backwards. And as we'll talk about with the swerve drive, um, there are some reasons that we want to put the x direction um, uh, in the direction that the robot typically moves forward. And so having the x direction be along the length of the field made it a little bit more likely that um, when we start autonomous, the x direction for the robot and the x direction for the field would be lined up. We could have done the other option. It would have been perfectly fine. Um, that was just sort of the thought process behind that. Um, and then once we've, once we've set the X direction, uh, then you use something, then you need to put the, the Y direction in a, um, uh, so it's 90 degrees away from it, so you end up with the Y direction um, in this, this horizontal direction. And the other thing I should mention is if this is X and this is Y, um, the positive angular direction is this way. So if that's theta and this is your angle and you're measuring off of the x-axis, positive this way. So this, is, this would be zero degrees. This would be 90 degrees. Down here would be 180. And this would be 270. Uh, does that make sense to everyone? Are there any questions about how we set up the coordinates on the field? Okay. So let's see if I can clear all that part. Okay. So now that we sort of got the coordinates down here, let's talk about how we actually generate the text files um, that we that contain the autonomous play information. So if we go into the robot project, we've got a couple ones that are already made. And we'll start with aardvark, the aardvark play. Does anyone remember I want to talk about um, what the aardvark play does? It does nothing. Correct. So first rule of having an autonomous robot is to have at least one option that does nothing. That way, if you're in a situation where um, something has gone catastrophically wrong with the, ro the robot in the previous match and you don't have time to fix it and you're worried about, you know, removing the robot would damage the robot, you can put the robot on the field for the next match and not have to worry about, you know, you can run the aardvark mode and not have to worry about it doing something insane or more damaging um, uh, during autonomous. So always have that that mode in place. Um, the reason I picked Aardvark was just that it starts with AA, so um, it always shows up as the first option in the drop down list, which makes it the default. So, again, if we're doing a demonstration, we've got little kids around, um, and someone goes into autonomous mode, the robot's not going to do anything unless they'd gone in and actually changed it off of the default Aardvark option to something else. So, um, that, that was the thought process there. So. The other thing I'll bring up is also available in the 2020 robot project is another text file called autonomous play syntax. 
and it's not fantastic, but it is what we have so far for um, basically an instruction manual for how to type out the autonomous code. It is, I think, as, I think as far as I know, it's, there's no problem, there's no like um, mistakes in it or typos, but it's definitely not super clear or super um, helpful. And so one of the things that we probably want to do and work on is come up with a system where um, we have like a more formal process for describing the syntax um, so that people can can write the autonomous plays a little bit more easily and we don't we don't forget how to do them. So what you'll find in the uh, autonomous play syntax text file is a list of all of the drive sequencer options that you have and a list of all of the subsystem sequencer options that you have. And so if we look at um, the aardvark autonomous play, what we see is drive weight. And if we go over to the other text file, we see drive weight equals a mode and then another parameter value. That means that it's got two arguments that it requires. So you have to type in two different things. Both of those things have to be separated by a comma. In all these cases, you also need a comma after the last one. That's because our parser isn't super smart. So um, it's really looking for the comma to know how to find the parameter, the, uh, each, each one of the arguments. And they always need a semicolon as well. Um, the first line, which I've indicated with a double hash mark, is a brief description of what that piece of code does. So this one says, it pauses the drive sequencer. And then uh, with other hash marks, uh, I've tried to indicate, <laughs> try to describe what each of the arguments are. So if we look at the modes, what you'll see is there's three different options, mode zero, mode one, and mode two. So if we were to put a zero in for the mode, which we have here for drive weight, that's gonna ask it to wait for a time delay in milliseconds. So Typically, that would ask us to put the number of milliseconds that we wanted to pause the drive sequencer for. However, you can also put in a negative one, and instead of looking um, for the number of milliseconds to wait here, it's going to look at the dashboard values. So this is how you would set this up to synchronize with any of our autonomous partners. Um, whereas, if we put in mode one, we'd be waiting for a certain step. To, uh, waiting for us to arrive at a certain step in the subsystem sequencer, or mode two, um, waiting for a certain amount of time since the shooter started shooting. Are there any questions so far about the drive wait command? Okay. And then the next command we've got is drive end, which is pretty simple. If we look at the little instruction manual, it says, it finishes the drive sequencer. So uh, once you get to drive end, it's going to um, go ahead and set all of the joystick values to zero, so we'll stop moving. And then the drive sequencer will end. It will not allow any more steps in autonomous to occur until you restart autonomous. And um, it has no arguments. So uh, it just is drive end equals and then the semicolon and doesn't require uh, any, any arguments. Then to separate our drive sequence commands from our subsystem sequence commands, we always have a star equals semicolon. Um, basically, we need the equals and the semicolon still because, again, our parser is not super smart, and so it needs the semicolon to find the end of the line. And I think it breaks if you don't have the equal sign. Um, I'm not sure about that. I think if it doesn't see an equal sign, it gets very happy. And then the star is what it's looking for to indicate that it is um, uh, a switching between the drive sequencer and the subsystem sequencer. That doesn't mean that you can't use any names for any functions that include a star. So please don't name like a drive command like drive star. Um, that, would, that would be unfortunate. So um, if we look at the manipulator commands, we have the very similar manip weight. Again, we can scroll down in our other text file and see that it, again, requires two arguments, a mode argument and a parameter argument. Um, 
I won't go through all these again in, in detail, but mode zero is again waiting for a time delay and we've entered negative one as the other parameter. And so again, it's waiting for the amount of time specified on the dashboard by the drivers. And then very similarly, we have a manip end, um, which will uh, uh, end the subsystem uh, sequencer and not allow any more steps to proceed. Um, theoretically, I think we could have not had any of the weights and just had the manip end and the drive end. Uh, I think we put in the weights just because we were unsure if the sequencer rebuilt um, handles only having one step, um, that this, the special case of only having one, one step. Um, and just rather than debug that issue, we went ahead and gave it two steps um, just to make sure that it wasn't going to be a problem. Um, any questions about the Aardvark autonomous mode? Okay. So let's look at a more complicated autonomous mode. Let's look at let's look at our fanciest one, um, or one of our fanciest ones. Let's look at Steel Two, Shoot Five, um, with an angle. This is the one that we were running in finals at Little Rock, and its goal is it starts pointed at uh, your own driver station, so pointed away from the goal. It lowers the intake, it drives and gets the two balls in your opponent's trench, and then simultaneously strafes and rotates the robot so that it's roughly in front of the target and pointed at the target. And then it switches to auto-targeting and shoots um, the hopefully five balls that it has in the hopper uh, while uh, actuating the intake to agitate the balls. Um, does anyone have any questions about what that autonomous mode is supposed to do? I'm um, just so we're all on that same page. Okay. So um, again, I think all of our autonomous modes have a manip weight and a drive weight at the beginning, and they all have a mode of negative one or mode zero and negative one parameter. So even if we wanted to wait for say half a second before we started, we would still always include another drive weight and a manip weight before that, that looks at the driver station value. That way all of our autonomous modes can always be synchronized in the same way um, based on our alliance partner. So we should always include that option. Um, as long as the default value of the driver station is zero, so unless the, the drivers intentionally type in a value, the autonomous mode will still start immediately. It'll only be delayed if they intentionally type in a value to synchronize um, with the Alliance partners. So if we look through the drive sequencer, the next thing after the drive weight is um, the drive path operation, which is the one that we didn't cover a whole bunch. And so if we scroll over here to drive path, there are four arguments that you have to enter. And then the description for it is that the robot follows a specified path. So um, after I go through this one, we'll switch over to my other laptop and we'll look at how to generate a path. But for right now, assume that the path is already generated. So the first argument is the distance from goal. So this is the maximum distance error that the robot can be from the endpoint of the path in order for us to proceed to the next step. So Theoretically, the robot starts very far away from the end of the path and it gets closer to the end of that path. Um, we don't want to say that the robot has to be exactly at the end of the path before we proceed, because in real life, we're never going to hit that. Um, the PID is never going to be good enough to get, you know, exactly zero inches away from the endpoint. So we need to give it some tolerance. Um, I would, in, in general, you should give it as large of a tolerance as, as you can accept. So if you're picking up a ball here, we have a fairly small tolerance. We're saying we want to be within an inch and a half of the balls. Maybe that's closer than we need to be. We have, didn't really have a chance to tune it. That's what we picked. For some of the other stuff, like when we're doing auto-targeting, um, we have a much larger, uh, a much larger error, acceptable error. Does anyone want to guess or talk about 
why why we would want to have the largest error that we can accept. Like why we we want to only require um, the largest error that we can get away with. Because the auto targeting will correct you. Right. So that that's why it'll work. So that's that's good. So the auto targeting will will correct for that. Um, because we're still always tracking our positions. We always know where we are. And so the auto targeting can compensate. So Alex, what about why would we want to, why wouldn't we want to be super accurate and get within an inch for the auto targeting? Time. Time. Yeah, exactly. So um, in order to hit a really fine target, like a and like not a not the ball target, but like a target location on the field, the robot's going to slow down in order to be as accurate as it can be because it can't hit that you know that little spot in the field what at full speed and so um if you you know for the more accurate that you want to be you're going to have to hit it at a slower velocity and so the amount of time that that autonomous mode is going to take increases whereas if you're okay with staying at a couple feet per second and just sort of blowing past or getting kind of close to your position and the taunt you might save a second or a fraction of a second off of that stuff in the mode, which would be really valuable. Um, the next, uh, the next um, argument that you have is angle from the goal. And this is very similar. This is the maximum angle error that we can accept. Um, so all of our paths have a specified position that has to end up with and a specified angle that the robot has to end up pointed at. Um, and again, same kind of rules apply. Uh, you should um, put in the largest accept, the largest error that you could possibly accept. Um, that way you can speed up the amount of time that it, uh, reduce the amount of time it takes to run the autonomous play. The next parameter is the timeout parameter, which the definition here is the maximum elapsed time before advancement, uh, set to negative one if you don't want any timeout at all. Does anyone want to guess or talk about why we include a timeout option when we're um, following the path? Because if it doesn't work, you don't want to sit there forever. Exactly. So you could imagine a scenario where uh, another robot gets in our way and we get pinned. Or we um, end up, you know, we go a little bit too far and we get stuck against a wall and we can't go any further. If we get hung up on a ball, any of those options. Um, we may not be able to complete the path to within the error that we want. In some situations, we may still be able to recover portions of the autonomous mode. So you could imagine if we uh, got blocked getting the two balls from the opponent's uh, a trench, we wouldn't get those two balls, but we could go ahead and swerve over to our goal and shoot the three balls that we have. And so the timeout allows us to basically say, hey, we're waiting too long. Um, go ahead and uh, uh, proceed to the next step. Now, our uh, timeout code is the time from that start to start of that step. So it's not super intelligent. Um, and then so it needs to be tuned. So ideally you would have time to practice your autonomous modes and see roughly how much time they usually take to run and then give yourself a timeout that's maybe a half a second or something longer than the typical amount of time it takes to run the autonomous mode. Uh, we didn't really have time to tune that. So these values are sort of guessed, unfortunately. Um, you don't want to go too low because you don't want to just never complete your autonomous mode. Something we could talk about doing in the future is uh, estimating, having the code estimate how long the toss mode should take, and then the timeout would be added. And so if the code estimates that it should take five and a half seconds to complete the path, um, then your timeout would be, you know, a second plus the five and a half seconds. So it'd be a total of six and a half seconds. So um, that would require us to have a little bit less tuning and allow us to generate these toss modes faster um, without being able to practice them on the field. Um, there are scenarios where you might not want there to be any timeout, and that's why there's this negative one option. 
Um, any thoughts on situations where you wouldn't want there to be a timeout? So what about last year? So what if one of our paths was jump off the halves and then at the end of the path raise the elevator and for whatever reason the path didn't work and we stayed on the hab? What if we raised the, and so if we had a timeout, um, we might end up with the elevator getting raised while we're still on the hab. And then we, we try to auto target and we drop off the half with the elevator up, which is our worst <laughs> possible nightmare that we could have. So there, there are situations where you just don't want to time out. You say, hey, if you didn't follow your path correctly, um, there's nothing else that you can do. Either it's not safe or there's no points for you to score. So go ahead and just chill out for the rest of autonomous and go with it until you are. And then the, uh, the fourth argument that we have is the name of the path. So Specifically, this is the name of the Excel file for the path um, that we're going to be following. In this case, this is the path um, to steal the ball. So this is the path from our initiation line up to um, the control spinner for the opposing alliance. Any questions or comments on the syntax or the, uh, the drive path um, operation? Okay, so I'm going to hop over to the manipulator side for a second. So the very first manipulator command we have is manip wait. Again, to synchronize us with any autonomous partners. Uh, we definitely don't want to be in a scenario where you have a manip wait for synchronization and then not a drive wait. Um, that could desynchronize your two sequencers and that would be a problem. Um, so just be mindful of that. The very first command that we have is manip intake, um, which if we look, manip intake says it toggles the intake on or off and it has no parameters. So um, the reason it has no parameters is uh, the way the driver's button works is they press a button and the intake deploys and they press that same button and the intake retracts. So um, you do have to manually in your head, you know, when you're writing the code, keep track of whether the intake is down or up um, because your intake, your, if you call the manip intake command, um, it's going to, uh, you know, if it's, if it's retracted, it will deploy it. And if it is deployed, it will retract it. So it just changes the state of the intake. That command does everything that the teleoperated command does. So it will extend the pistons to actually drop the intake. It'll turn on the rollers. It will do everything that it normally does in teleoperated because again, we're just, we're just faking the um, physical button press the driver would normally normally press on the joystick. The next uh, manipulator command is a manip wait command, and it's saying it's mode one. And so mode one is wait for a drive sequence step. And the uh, step number is three. And so what it's saying is we're not going to proceed with a manipulator sequencer until after we've gotten to step three of the drive system sequencer. So that would be step, uh, I believe it is step zero, step one, step two, step three. So we're going to wait. The, the whole subsystem sequencer is going to pause and not do anything else until we get to this, um, until we get to this drive system step. So this allows us to maintain synchronization between the two sequencers. And that's sort of what we talked about, how we, how we do that. Are there any questions about the subsystem sequencer up to this point? Okay. So um, I'll flip this back to the drive system sequencer. Uh, the next thing we had after the drive path was a drive wait for 250 milliseconds. Um, we probably don't need that. Uh, that again was put in there because it's not, uh, we have it tested going directly from one path to another path in the autonomous code. We just never got around to testing it. So uh, we have a, a quarter second wait in there just to make sure we don't have any, um, any problems. This is immediately a place where 
you know, you know, as we were going to Smoky Mountain, um, we would have been looking at saving time so we could do more autonomous. So we'd be looking at eliminating things like this. We would make sure that the autonomous mode works without it, and we would immediately cut it because that right there is a three-quarter second that we aren't doing anything else for. Um, the next command is another drive path. And this one is the path from the opponent's control spinner all the way out to our target, our, our shooting position. Um, it has a larger accepted error in both distance and angle because, again, we don't need to be super accurate before we shoot. And then uh, we have a longer timeout because that path takes longer to traverse. So um, we have to have, give it more time. Um, one thing I'll note, I'll note about transitions between the paths. Uh, our, the way that our pure pursuit algorithm works is pretty robust. So the endpoints of the paths don't have to um, match up exactly. Uh, I would recommend that when you draw the paths, which I'll show, that at least when they're drawn, the endpoint of the first one and the start point of the second one do match. In real life, because you've got these acceptable errors, they're not going to be the same. The robot will jump to the next path. Um, the only thing to be cautious about is that if you have a really large jump, like if you're many feet away from the end of one path and the start of the next path, um, the robot's going to have to jump a lot. And it, it, it doesn't do a smooth, it's going to go there really fast because it knows it's really far away. It's not going to plot it's a new smooth path to it. So it's going to be kind of a jerky motion, which could throw off um, your wheel encoders and sort of reduce the overall accuracy of your autonomous mode. So we do want to try and avoid those where possible, um, but it will, it will physically work. Um, this is one of the reasons that the cheesy proofs have dynamic passing on their on their robots so um, if they finish a path in the wrong location they will dynamically change the next path segment to match up with the current endpoint to make it start point match up with the current endpoint so they can plot a smooth path back onto the next intended path um, so they take everything that we're doing in python and then actually have the robot run it itself dynamically in real time and that gives them some some advantages there. Um, if we go back to the manipulator sequencer, we've waited for us to get to that second drive path command. And when we've done that, we're going to toggle the intake again. At this point, that will retract the intake. We then have a, another manip wait, which is um, uh, mode one. So we're waiting for a drive sequence step again. And it's waiting for drive sequence step number four. At that zero, one, two, three, we're waiting for us to finish the path before we do anything else. The thing that we're doing after we finish the path, after we get to um, position four, is uh, we're going to go into auto targeting mode. So if we go to the manip auto target command, um, we have two modes. Uh, mode zero is exit auto targeting, and mode one is enter auto targeting. Um, the reason that this isn't a toggle and you have an, the ability to exit or enter is that the driver's physical button is a hold. So um, they mode zero or sorry, mode one will actually hold the right trigger, uh, fake fake hold the right trigger, and mode zero will fake release the right trigger on the joystick. The next weight that we have is a um, uh, five second, or sorry, a mode five weight, uh, which is not, I just realized is not in the documentation, because that's the one that we added at Little Rock. So a mode five weight is almost identical to a mode four weight. So it's waiting for, in this case, 3,000 milliseconds, three, three seconds since the shooter started shooting, with the addition of the intake toggling down and up to agitate the balls. Um, so same thing as a mode four, but it, it moves the intake to agitate the balls. Um, at the end of those three seconds, we will disengage auto-targeting, and then we will end the manipulator sequencer. 
Uh, after we finish that path on the drive sequencer, we have a wait for three seconds. Um, let's see, mode two. We have a wait for um, how to shoot. Mode two on the drive system wait is wait for, in this case, three seconds since the shooter started shooting. So it matches up with the wait um, down here on the manipulator side so that these two sequencers stay synchronized. In the current version of the autonomous play, we could delete this and it would work the exact same way because the next thing we're going to do is just end of the sequencer anyways. But if we wanted to do something afterwards, like drive over to our trench, we would want to have this line so that we the two sequencers would stay synchronized and wouldn't end our, our drive sequencer. Are there any questions on this autonomous mode? Any thoughts on how we can make this autonomous mode faster? So what kinds of things could, what could we be doing in parallel as we're following this, the path from the control panel spinner to the target location? So I'll pick on Adam here, since he was the one driving the robot. If you were driving the robot from one position to the position you wanted to shoot from Adam, what, 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 what might you do as you got close to that position even before you stopped moving? Okay, so spin up the shooter. Uh, excellent answer. So uh, we are already shooting, spinning up the shooter. So the way we did that this year was when we're in autonomous mode, um, the shooter is always spinning. Um, so we are doing that. What's another thing that Adam or another driver might do right as they got close to the target? Amelie, any thoughts? We talked about it for a little bit, but that was two months ago. I don't remember. So if we look at uh, so, what, so one of the things that we can do is because auto targeting right now just controls the orientation of the robot, we can actually switch into auto targeting mode while we're still following the path. And so that will get us, yeah, so Adam says start targeting the chat menu, exactly. So um, the, this path has a, an angle that it's trying to get the robot to. Um, that angle is not going to be exactly what we want for to actually shoot. So we'd be getting to the end of the path, getting our angle kind of right, and then having to still move the angle of the robot again, get the cam get the target in frame, all that kind of stuff with the camera. Um, because of the way the auto targeting is set up this year, you can drive while auto targeting. We haven't tested it in autonomous, but there's no reason to think it won't work. So you could actually start auto targeting as you're driving along the path so that you're lined up with the target right at the um, uh, right as soon as you're done with the path and you're, you're ready to go. The, the way that you would do that is instead of having a manip wait uh, mode one, if you went to a manip wait mode three, you could start, um, you could wait until you're a certain number of inches away from the end of the current path. So you could wait until you're 100 inches away from the end of the path so you're, you know, 100 inches away from where you need to be to shoot and start your auto targeting then. And that would speed up this mode. And that was one of the things we were going to look at as we looked at speeding up all of our auto modes. Um, any, any questions about this auto mode? Okay. Um, the only thing I'll show about this is, um, this is actually taking a little bit longer than I thought, but the only other thing that I'll show about this is one of the ones we didn't cover was any of the drive X commands or drive X or drive Y commands. So if we look at, um, we'll just look at uh, move off a knit line, shoot three balls. This one was pretty simple. This one was, um, we'll back away from the initialization line. Uh, we'll point at the target and we'll shoot the three balls we have in the hoppers. That was sort of the thing we said that was the minimum viable autonomous mode. And um, uh, really all the commands are the same as what we saw before, uh, with the exception of we have this drive distance X command. 
And if we look in the instructions, it says it drives the robot in the field-oriented X direction. So that is not forward backwards on the robot. That is um, down the length of the field, so along the long direction of the field. And the drive Y command would be along the width of the field. And that is true regardless of what orientation the robot is placed in. So um, the positive and negative everything is based off of the field and not based off of the robot. And our parameters, there's three, there's two arguments. The first one is um, the distance we wanted to go, which in this case was negative 40 inches. So we wanted to come backwards, negative 40 inches in the X direction. And we wanted to do that with um, negative 30% power, negative 0 0.3 power. Um, again, the signs on the power and the distance should match um, because the code does not handle that automatically right now. Um, any questions about how to create, how the, the syntax for the autonomous plays before we move on to the next thing? Okay. So, um, what I'm going to do here is switch over, hopefully, to my other laptop that has a Python editor in it so we can run the uh, um, path planner here. If I can stop sharing there, then I can share this screen. Can everyone see that screen now? I have access to my chat window already. Yep. You can see that. Okay. So um, I have not gone around to uh, doing what's called compiling the Python code into an executable that we can just run on anyone's laptop. So right now it's just, I think, my laptop and the Alienware are set up to do the path planner. Um, one of the reasons I haven't compiled it is it's, A, it's kind of a pain to do, and um, B, because there's some talk about us moving over to LabVIEW for this anyway, in which case um, we would use the LabVIEW compiler instead of the Python compiler. So I didn't want to invest too much time in that. So the way the path planner works, so the, the goal of the path planner is for us to be able to pick some different points on a field and have the robot follow a smooth path between those points and uh, um, during autonomous. And so once you open up our, our Python editor with the code is called spider, and it's a little web icon that's pinned on the Alienware. Once you open that up, um, usually we have the code pinned in here, uh, the main.py file for the path planner. Um, again, we'll come up with a cleaner solution this later. You'll hit the green run arrow, and you'll get a little pop up window here. So it's here to wild boss. You have a couple of settings that you can have. Um, we haven't really played around a whole bunch with the different settings. Um, we can talk about what that would look like. Ideally, we would have had our robot drive base and tuned to all of these for, you know, to make it go as fast as possible, but these are sort of the default values and we never had a chance to, to change them. The parameters that you can change are the maximum robot velocity that you want to allow in autonomous. This does not have to be the maximum robot velocity. And in fact, it really needs to be a good bit lower than the maximum robot velocity. Um, we'll talk more about that if we ever do the session on the pure, pure pursuit algorithm. But essentially, um, if the target velocity in autonomous is ever higher than what the robot can actually achieve, you're going to have instability problems in the PID controller that's trying to maintain the robot's position. And so um, we're, uh, you do want to put in, uh, oh, Dominic says I'm starting to sound like a robot. I moved my phone closer. Does that help? You guys hear me a little better? Alex says yes. Okay. Trying to keep it close. I'll try and keep it closer to me. All right. So um, that that maximum set velocity does need to be a little bit lower than the max robot speed. The next option is the step size, which I'll talk about um, as we go through the path planner. 
the minimum turn radius is kind of a funny one. Um, this would be the tightest turn that the robot would be able to make. So a smaller number would be a tighter turn and a larger number would be a um, less tight turn. Uh, we could probably go even lower than this. This is actually 12 inches is from the, uh, um, using the butterfly drive from last year. Since we have a swerve drive this year, we could probably go to even tighter turn just because the robot's not actually physically turning. It's uh, um, um, uh, just moving the swerve wheel. There is also a maximum turn radius. Um, so there's a minimum and a maximum. The, the maximum is a little bit less important to tune. There are some scenarios where uh, uh, it'd be nice to have it handled automatically, but typically that one's sort of handled by how you drop the points. Are there any questions about um, these tuning parameters? Okay. The so next thing that you would do is go to File, Open a Field Map. And included in the Autonomous Path Planner repository, so if you go up one level, is um, the fields from 2019 and 2020. So I will click the 2020 field. It's literally, it's literally just a picture of the field. And you have some options here. You can load saved waypoints. I'm going to go ahead and load a saved waypoint so you can see what a path looks like, and then we'll go through how to edit the path and then how to create a new path. So I'll say yes, and then we can go to the paths that we made in 2020. And so I'll take the one that we were talking about, which is um, we'll do the path from stealing balls. So this is the path from the opponent's control panel spinner to our targeting location. Okay, and I'll take a second to load the path. And this is what we get here. So each one, so, uh, so first off, the robot's starting here at the control panel spinner. And it is ending up um, down here uh, near to the to the target. So um, the zero zero coordinates is in this corner. So you're always this alliance here on the left hand side, and this year you're scoring down here on the right hand side. So um, your robot starts on the right hand side, and you're over you're, the drivers are over on the left hand side. Uh, so the robot's going to start here, and it's going to follow this path to this location. Um, the red circles are the specific waypoints that the person has dropped. So these are points that you want the robot to sort of get to in order to follow the path. The colored line is the path that the robot's actually going to take. Because of the restrictions on how tight the turn radius can be for a robot, uh, there are going to be waypoints that you're not actually going to hit. So um, the way that we design the path following algorithm, we do not require the robot to um, hit, the, hit, hit each individual waypoint. Um, the waypoints can sort of push and pull the path, but you don't actually have to hit the waypoint. So be aware of that while you're dropping them. The color of the points indicates the robot velocity. So a darker color is, um, a darker part of the path is slower and a brighter, more yellow part of the path is a, is a faster robot velocity. If you zoom in on the path, so I use a little magnifying glass here, you can start to see all of the individual points. So these points are spaced one inch apart. That's what that tuning parameter is for how far apart you want to space each one of the little dots. And then the little black lines that are coming off of each dot is the target, target robot orientation for that point. So the robot starts out, line we pointed sort of um, backwards towards the, the drivers. And as we go along this path, you can see the target angles actually moving. So as we follow the path, in addition to smoothly changing our position, the robot's also going to smoothly change its orientation to get pointed towards the target. Are there any questions so far about, um, uh, are there any questions so far about the path, the path stuff that we've talked about to this point? Okay. 
Um, to zoom back out again, the easiest thing to do is hit the little home icon in the top. Um, now, the first thing that you might do is you want to edit one of these waypoints. So if you've loaded a previous path, uh, one of the reasons you want to do that is because you need to tweak the autonomous mode. So the way you do that is you right click on one of the red dots. And when you right click on the red dot, you're going to have the information for that waypoint. There's four fields. The first two fields are the coordinates of the waypoint. So the X position and then the Y position. So this one is 423 inches in the X and 295 inches in the Y direction. The next field is the target velocity in feet per second. Um, five feet per second is sort of a slower speed, like maybe, maybe slow coming into a medium speed. And then the last angle is, um, uh, the, the last field is the target angle orientation for the robot. So uh, zero degrees would be pointing from left to right, so pointing towards the target. And then 180 degrees is actually pointed away from the target, so it's pointed from right to left, so pointing back towards the drivers. Um, the reason this one is 180 right there is because we're at 180 uh, at this coordinate when we come out of the path that um, the previous path to steal the balls. Um, in order to update your changes, so say you wanted to move the x coordinate a little bit further this way, so let's go to 460 inches. All you do is click close on the, uh, the, the window and it will update the position of that waypoint. If you make a change and you don't want to save it, um, so like if I say I updated the velocity to 15 feet per second and I didn't want to save that, uh, the way it works right now is kind of janky because I have a cancel button, but if you delete both the X and the Y coordinates from this, um, it won't update the Oh, sorry, that deletes the point. Right now, there's no way to just back out. There's no way to, 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 to undo. So you have to um, uh, just not type that in. If you want to delete a waypoint, you delete the X and the Y coordinate, and that deletes the, uh, the waypoint. So uh, I forgot about that. Um, are there any questions on editing so, and editing the waypoints? Okay, um, let's see. So if you wanted to save this new path, you would click the X on the um, field drawing and it will ask you for a save location. Oops. So you can name your, yeah, it's not, no, yeah, it's like maximized. So um, you can save your path to uh, wherever folder you want, I'll just call it new path. And then you can click save. I will go to that location here. Maybe. No. First. Oops. Okay, so the, the new path is what we saved. Uh, oh, interesting. On the Alienware, it puts the .xls after it, but it did not here. So if that happens and doesn't show up with the .xls, um, you can just type it in. Or uh, Microsoft will recognize it as um, an Excel file. So at this point, you can go ahead and open it up. And you're going to see a couple of things. You're going to see a whole bunch of information. So um, each one of these rows is one of the points that's spaced one inch apart. So this is, the first column is the distance along the path. So we start out at zero inches along the path, and we go to one inch along the path, two inches along the path, three inches along the path. We have the estimated time along the path. So this is an estimate. Uh, this is not necessarily going to be <clears throat> what the robot's going to take, but this is an estimate based on the goal velocity. So, um, you know, at 32 inches along the path, we're about, uh, it took us about a second to get to 32 inches um, along the path. The next two columns are the X and Y coordinates. 
the next column is the target velocity. Um, you will notice that it's been converted into inches per second from feet per second. That's because the path follower code in LabVIEW uh, requires it in inches per second. The next column is the goal orientation in, in uh, degrees. Now we also have, so this is, so these first uh, six columns are what the path planner actually uses in LabVIEW. These remaining columns here are for the path planner. So these are the waypoints that you put in. Um, these are the values that get reloaded. So when I said I wanted to load old waypoints and I clicked an Excel file, um, uh, this is the information that it uses to basically load the saved path. Um, so you can edit it again, but these values aren't actually used um, by LabVIEW um, uh, uh, by the robot. Uh, one of the other things that you have to do, unfortunately, which is not automated right now, is um, LabVIEW can't open XLS files on the Robo on the Robo Rio. It doesn't support that. It does support CSV files. Uh, we were having some trouble with the current version of the Python pack, Python library that we have installed properly saving CSV files, so we do have to do it manually. Um, the way that you can do that is on the Alienware, it is using a newer version of um, Excel, and if you go to File, I think under Options, um, there's like a conversion button. Oh, this one actually has it too. I don't think. No, there's a, there's another conversion. If there's an export button, I think it's called, um, and it, you set, it just has an option for export to CSV, and you can just click that. Um, in my very old version of Microsoft Excel, um, I don't have an export to CSV option, so I have to do a file save as um, CSV and then uh, and then save the file that way. And I won't go through that because it's sort of a pain to do in the older version of Excel and I don't think any of you or the Alienware have the older version of Excel. Um, they'll just be using the newer version. Uh, any questions on sort of the Excel file or anything else we talked about with the path planner so far? Okay. So let's say we wanted to create a new path. Uh, again, we do open a field map. So we'll open the 2020 field map again. And instead of saying yes to load state waypoints, I'm going to say no. <clears throat> and the way that you drop a new waypoint is uh, by right clicking on the map. The reason that we have to use a right click instead of a left click is I ha have had a chance. To, it's sort of a pain to still use the magnifying glass um, and avoid accidentally dropping points. There are workarounds um, to do that in this type of GUI interface, but it sort of wasn't worth the pain. So it was just easier to make it so that you left click to use zoom and right click um, to drop the waypoints. So you should always drop the waypoints um, roughly close to where you think the robot's actually going to start. Again, it doesn't have to be insanely accurate um, because the robot is going to jump onto the path so it's going to know its, its real location. Typically, we're going to start on the initiation line um, and we're going to have another piece of code that's going to back us away from the initiation line, the drive X command. So I'm going to start the path right here. So I'm going to right click and uh, it's bringing up the coordinates of the point that I just pressed down. Um, but you can also type in new ones if you want. So if you click X, it will drop that point. But, uh, you may have to type in a velocity. Let's try that again. It may crash without a velocity. And zero feet per second. If that comes up. Strange. Mm. 
You may also need a starting handle. I'm going to start us at zero feet per second and pointed towards the target, like pointing straight, facing straight forward. There we go. So now that we've got the, uh, the waypoint. Um, ignore the blue line. That's something that I was working on to show the robot, um, like a graphic of the robot that's not done yet. Um, so got the red dot. We could then place another red dot here. Right here, I'll just do this. Place one there. Um, and then uh, I'll just do the same thing. I'll type in 10 feet per second here. And uh, that's what that looks like. So we've got a little path that starts at zero feet per second and goes to 10 feet per second and sort of goes in a straight line. If you wanted to go in a perfectly straight line, the easiest way that I would suggest to do that is you right click on the points. And you know, if you want to go a horizontal line, I'd make the Y values the same. So We'll just say it's pretty close to 85 inches. And then we'll right click on this one and we'll say 85 inches as well. Now you've got, oh, it still looks kind of crooked. That's strange. Oh, because it's 83, not 85. Okay, now, now we have a nice little straight line. Um, one of the reasons that we did the path algorithm that we uh, chose, which is a little bit different from what other teams have been running, is that it allows you to make straight segments. Um, robots tend to behave pretty well, particularly um, non-swerve drives, if they go in a straight line, so it can make your autonomous a little bit more reliable. So uh, we can we have the ability to do both curves and perfectly straight lines. Other autonomous modes that support curves um, tend to prevent you from really programming a straight line, which I know seems kind of weird, but um, that's that's sort of the end effect of one of the algorithms that, that tends to get used. Um, you'll notice that if I then add another waypoint here, um, we're no longer, we're going to hit this curve, we're no longer going to go straight to the center of this waypoint. So we are going to get a little bit of a move off of the waypoint, we're not going to exactly hit all of our waypoints. We will always hit the beginning waypoint exactly and the ending waypoint exactly. Uh, a couple other things to mention. <clears throat> we found that you actually really don't want to start your velocity at zero. Uh, the reason for that is uh, the robot accelerates, tends to accelerate really slowly, and the PID algorithm doesn't really like um, starting from a zero velocity, so the robot takes like a long time and tends to stutter. So this year's robot, I think we found that starting at like two feet per second um, works pretty well. Um, the robot obviously doesn't physically start at two feet per second, but the target velocity immediately goes from it being standstill to going to two feet per second rather than ramping up from zero feet per second to one feet per second to two feet per second. That allows us to sort of get jump started and on the path. Um, the other thing I'll mention is, so you can type in different orientation angles, and the robot will smoothly, with a sort of drive, smoothly change from, say, zero degree orientation to 90 degree orientation. Um, you have another option that is available to you if you're running a um, a non-swerve robot. So if you're running a robot that doesn't independently turn, and that is you can have the angle of the robot follow the straight ahead direction along the path. So if I don't type in anything, you'll see that it now says ahead in this column, in this, in this row. That's gonna set the goal orientation to be the direction of the robot if it were to just follow the path completely. And so you see all the orientation lines now line up along that path, along the direction of the path. Um, do, do, do. We, uh, with the swerve drive, we really don't want to use that. We want to be controlling the orientation independently. And so uh, we're explicitly 
telling it what orientation to, to be at at each at each coordinate. Um, the path planner is not super smart or super robust right now, so it's definitely possible to build paths that you cannot uh, the robot can't physically achieve by having um, very high velocities or accelerating faster than the robot can actually accelerate or making some very complicated turns like I think if I um, let's see if I can break it here uh, there, there are some cases that I found where the smoothing doesn't happen properly and still get very sharp corners, but um, I actually seems to be doing pretty well right now. One of the reasons that's waiting is that it's actually simulating. Um, oh, that may have crashed it. So you can make uh, paths that will, will break it. So um, I, I don't know that in normal robot use, you would ever make a path that this wouldn't handle, but you could make a path that I don't think you'd want to run with the robot. Um, that can break this. Um, the other thing is you don't have to end at a zero velocity. Uh, again, like the path from the control panel spinner to the auto targeting does not end at a zero velocity, and neither does picking up the balls. Actually, ends at um, a higher velocity. Again, that keeps your velocity, the robot's velocity, up. Um, and so uh, you complete the autonomous mode. That step of the autonomous mode faster, uh, as long as you don't care too much about uh, the accuracy of the final position of the robot. Um, are there any questions about the path planner or anything that we've talked about with creating autonomous modes so far? Okay, so the last thing I'll do is I'll just talk briefly, and unfortunately I can't really demonstrate it so well, um, how you would transfer the files to the robot. So the way that you do that is with a program called FileZilla. And what you need to do is you need a USB tether from, well, okay, I shouldn't say that. Theoretically, the way that it works right now, <laughs> I'm gonna throw in a whole bunch of caveats here. Um, you have two options for transferring files on the RoboRio. Uh, the one that is currently working with the computers that we have right now, which right now is just my laptop, is a USB tether from my laptop to the RoboRio's USB-B port. The Alienware does seem to sometimes be able to go over Ethernet if you plug the Ethernet cable into the Ethernet switch that's going into the radio on the robot. Both of those methods are supposed to work on any computer and just work. Uh, we've been having some technical issues, mostly on the laptop side. I don't think it's anything wrong with the RoboRios or any of the networking here. Um, we're having some problems with that. Um, as far as I know, there is no way to do this wirelessly. So that is one downside is we do have to tether to the robot either with an Ethernet cable or a USB-B cable in order to upload the autonomous modes. Um, if you go into uh, the critical documents repository and open up, um, where is it? The robot networking text file. Uh, um, you will see instructions for, um, uh, where is it? You'll see instructions for files off. So you would type this RoboRio 4265 frc.local into the host. Your username is LV user. There is no password and your port number is 22. And then you can hit quick connect. Once the robot connects and uh, normally it takes two tries. I don't know why the first try doesn't work, but second try typically works. You will then see all the files that are currently on the RoboRio with those folders that we talked about before for the autonomous plays and the autonomous paths. And you can drag and drop the file. You can drag and drop a file into the section here where you'll have a folder and it will upload um, upload that file. Uh, strongly would recommend that you do not upload more than one file at a time. FileZilla does not seem to handle uploading multiple files simultaneously particularly well when it tends to crash. 
Um, when you're done, definitely go ahead and click up here. This will be a red X when you're connected, and that will disconnect you. On the Alienware, this information is already stored in um, the memory for FileZilla, so typically you can just click the green, and that will basically auto-fill these fields and go ahead and connect um, using the, the parameters that you set last time. So you click this, upload your file, and then click the red X to disconnect. And you should disconnect before you physically remove the tether key. Um, are there any questions about creating autonomous modes before we move on to sort of drive stuff? No questions at all. So everyone can create an autonomous mode uh, from scratch. Any any comments? Any thoughts on improvements, restrictions, anything like that? See, is Mr. Shannonfield on here? Is, is he on here, Alex? No, he's zooming with either some work people or I don't know. But I can hear it through the wall. Okay. Well, I was, I was just asking because um, Mr. Shanfield usually has lots of um, suggestions and ideas, so I was hoping he'd have some for us. Okay. Channel okay. I enter Mr. Shanfield. Um, Luke, um, <laughs> tell us about more. I don't know. I was trying. It was bad. <laughs> you were trying. You were trying to channel your dad. Yeah, I, I can't do it that well. Let's see. Okay. Well, um, let me double check and make sure we covered anything that. I think we did. Okay, so uh, we will now go on to the swerve drive stuff. Um, we'll get to wherever we get to with that tonight. Uh, this is going to take multiple sessions to get through all of it. Um, I uploaded the schedule to Slack, so it should be uh, should be there. Um, but I'll sort of go through it, just sort of an outline, um, so everyone knows where we're going. Uh, we're going to talk about first some background and a little background for the Swerve Drive, and uh, a little bit of a review on. Um, uh, PID just briefly because we're going to use that for some some different different things. Uh, the next thing we need to talk about is the difference between what we call vectors and scalars. So there'll be a little bit of math there that we'll then use in order to convert our joystick values, so the three joysticks that we use, into the robot's angle uh, and speed that the robot should be going at. We'll then talk about how we take the goal angle and convert it into something that the PID algorithm can actually understand to physically move the wheels. We'll talk about how we integrate the uh, inertial measurement unit, the IMU, so that we can have field-oriented versus robot-oriented control. Um, having joystick dead bands and scaling the joystick values is actually a little bit more complicated with a swerve drive than it is for a non-swerve drive, so we'll talk about how to do that. Um, just because it is there and present, we can also go ahead and talk about driver profiles and how those are set up and configured on the driver station just because it's, it's sort of right there and it's pretty easy to talk about. The next set of items are sort of improvements. So I would sort of say that you could get all the way to maybe these options and you could have a swerve drive that would work. Um, and so we actually started with, you know, in our very first video of you know, midnight or oh, sorry, 11 o'clock on uh, December 31st or 2019. I believe that we were to this point, and then later that night, just before midnight, we got to field oriented control. So we had a working swerve drive with those uh, those tasks complete. The next set of tasks are improvements, things to make the robot more drivable and more controllable and more reliable. So the first one is talking about um, how do we keep the um, swerve modules pointed in the correct direction and so that it doesn't jiggle the robot when you're trying to make fine adjustments. We'll talk about how we integrate auto-targeting. 
and then how we modified the auto targeting code in order to be an anti drift code. So um, the swerve drives tend to drift because as hard as Adam tries, he did not make all the sort of modules completely 100% identical. And so, and the robot also doesn't, also doesn't have all the weight in exactly the same places. And there's really nothing you can do about that. Um, I mean, there's just limitations. And so um, the, we're correcting some of that drifting in software. We'll also talk about um, how we integrate safeties and um, how we handle when a swerve module fails and what kinds of changes in the code we have to make. And then the last one is one that we sort of worked on. Um, so Alex wrote the code for this. It's, it's sitting there in, in there. And this allows us to rotate the robot about centers of rotation that aren't the center of the robot to help us get out of defense. Um, it turns out that the, uh, the actual code to make the robot do this is pretty doable. The challenge that we ran into was having a way for the robot, the driver to actually control this. And it's actually very difficult to control the robot in this mode. Um, and so that's why it hasn't been fully implemented in the code. But we'll talk about um, how the math works and talk about see if we can come up with any solutions um, for how the robot to drive can actually control this so that we can use this in the future. Are there any questions before we get started? Okay. So let me, I'm just going to go ahead and bring up. I have these so I have a white background here so I can draw. So just really quickly so that everyone's on the same page here, I'm going to define the coordinate systems for the robot just like I define the coordinate systems for the field. So we have a square robot. Uh, that's as perfect square as you can see. Beautiful. And uh, we do have a front of the robot, which we decided was the intake. Um, the robot does need a front in code, even if it doesn't have a front in real life. And we chose the intake as being forward. Uh, <clears throat> we also decided that, let's see here. Oh, there's arrows. That. Forward on the robot is the X direction, and side and left, right on the robot is the Y direction. And positive angle is this way. So that way is positive theta angle. Uh, so that is um, counterclockwise. So um, this wasn't completely arbitrary. Um, the having X be the forward position for something that's moving is it's not necessarily a standard. And it's, it's, I don't know if I would call it a standard, but typically people define the X direction as the moving forward direction in a lot of engineering problems, whether it's in robotics or in my field, and as of manufacturing, X is the direction that the laser moves. Um, that's sort of a standard that a lot of people use. I don't know there's an official standard written down anywhere for that. Uh, you then have Y 90 degrees opposed to that. And then a positive theta angle is defined for you. So um, a positive theta is, should always be counterclockwise. Um, and that is, a math standard that pretty much everyone uses. Um, the next uh, sort of thing that we need to talk about is how do we number our SWERF modules? So we've got four SWERF modules. Does Alex, who knew this was coming, want to remind us which SWERF module is which? So I know zero is in the right top corner. And I know two is in the left back corner. But now here's where I mix it up every time. I don't know. I think three is in the right back corner. But I always get it wrong. And I don't know which one I'm thinking of whichever way. <laughs> you are correct. So zero is in the front right corner. And then just like we moved counterclockwise for the positive theta, 
we also move counterclockwise from the numbering. So we go um, uh, zero, one, two, three, counterclockwise around the robot. Does anyone have any questions on the swerve drive numbering or the, uh, the coordinate system that we've got? Okay. So before we go any further with the code, we have to talk a little bit about hardware. And Amelie is about to have an aneurysm, but that's okay. So um, the, the reason I'm going to talk about the hardware for this is A, we've got a lot of sensors that we need to work with. And B, um, we're asking the robot to do some pretty crazy things. And so there are going to be physical limitations with what the robot can physically do that we have to take into account with our code. And so a lot of code does sort of depend on that. So um, the, each Swerve module has two motors. It's got the uh, motor that drives the wheel, which we call the drive motor. It's got the motor that um, changes the module angle, and we call that the azimuth motor. Uh, I did not make up the word azimuth just to be annoying. Um, azimuth is a, is a fairly standard term for describing something that rotates in that particular plane. You see it a lot. Um, with swerve drives, you see it in astronomy, um, you see it in a couple other places. So not, not made up just for fun use. Um, you then have several encoders. You've got, e so each of the motors that we're using is a NEO right now. And whether we use a NEO or a Falcon in the future, they're gonna have integrated encoders. So there's uh, an integrated, Uh, encoder on the drive motor, and there's an integrated encoder on the azimuth motor. And then we have another encoder, which I'll call the, um, right now I'll call it the uh, it's the uh, we'll call it extra encoder on that azimuth motor. Does someone want to talk about or guess as to why we've got an extra encoder on the azimuth motor? How about we hear from the designer of the swerve drive? <laughs> I'm so sorry. I think Adam would be actually happier if there wasn't an extra encoder on the swerve drive. We also need to get Adam a mic at some point so he doesn't have to type everything out. Okay, so Adam says, so the extra encoder is uh, a one-to-one -one ratio with the angle of the module. So the encoder reads the angle of the module so that the robot doesn't have to do math to see what the angle of the module is, which can be a problem if the robot browns out. 
So yes. So uh, what Adam's saying is that um, for every 360 degrees that the azimuth motor spins, or that the wheel module spins, the extra encoder will also spin exactly 360 degrees. So one degree on uh, the azimuth on the on the module azimuth angle is always going to be exactly equal to one degree on this extra encoder, and it's designed that way. The reason <clears throat> that we've done this is twofold. So, um, well, I don't know if I'd say twofold, but the, the reason that we've done this is, yeah, I guess I guess twofold is term. So, if the number of if if say the the encoder rotated only 180 degrees every time the module rotated 360 degrees. So if we had, let's see if I can draw here. This is going to be a very bad circle, so I apologize. If the module rotated 180 degrees, and then this is the module, and then the encoder rotated 360 degrees, we would have a bit of a problem. Now, you wouldn't be able to independently know whether the robot was, whether the robot's angle on, whether the robot, the angle of the module was here or here. Because it could be, uh, oh, sorry, let me do that here. So you wouldn't know whether the, the module is located there or there at any point in this process because the value on the encoder would be the same for these two different locations at angular locations on on the wheel now this isn't an unsolvable problem you could notice in the code that as you spun from 0 to 360 you could say okay this is the first time i've gone from 0 to 360 <clears throat> And then when you start going from 0 to 360, you can you say, okay, this is the second time I've gone from 0 to 360. And you could count, you know, which, which, um, uh, which number of the 0 to 360s you've done. And so you could have an encoder that spun more times in the motor and still um, back out the position. Uh, you could also have an encoder that, well, you could have an encoder that spun fewer times in the motor about you know if you want to even talk about that option. But but you could have an option where the encoder spins a lot more. And that is what you've got on the integrated encoder for the azimuth motor. So it spins multiple times for um, uh, it spins multiple times for one rotation of the uh, module angle. The challenge with this is that that number of rotation counts has to be stored somewhere. Some computer somewhere has to have, uh, has to remember that value. And so if, you know, I, I can't remember if it was in the last meeting or maybe the meeting before, we talked about the difference between um, volatile memory like in RAM and non-volatile memory on your hard drive as a file. That piece of information is always going to get stored in volatile memory. So if you lose power to that computer, you lose memory of what step you're on and what um, uh, rotation you're on. And effectively, you now forget what direction your wheel is pointing. So even though you've got that encoder, you now no longer know exactly which direction the wheel is pointing. This would be a very serious problem in a match. So Mars had this exact problem last year with their swerve drive, where under various situations, um, they would draw enough current on their motors that they would turn off the speed controller. They were using talons um, for their azimuth motors. And they were remembering that value on their talon, not on the robo Rio. And so when the talon would turn off and then turn back on again, they would have no idea which direction all four of their wheels were pointing. 
when your wheels aren't aligned in the swerve drive, it's basically impossible to drive. It, it becomes impossible to control that robot. And so there are many matches that they were in where they'll get, you know, a couple of seconds into the match, they'll lose power for a second, the robot will come right back up, but they'll be out for the rest of the match because their wheels will be pointed in the wrong directions. So that was one problem that we wanted to avoid. Um, the other advantage that we have by using this extra encoder is uh, the integrated code encoder here is, uh, is just a counter. So it, it counts pulses of light or magnetic pulses. I'm not sure which one it is. I would have to go back and look at the documentation from the NEO. I'm pretty sure that it is. Uh, actually, I think it's magnetic pulses. Anyways, it counts pulses of some signal as the motor rotates. That means that when you turn off your robot at the end of the match uh, and you turn the robot back on again, um, again, that counter is reset. And so um, you would have to start each match with all the wheels facing forward and ready to go so that when you run your code, the wheels are properly aligned. Um, that's not ideal. That's sort of one more thing that the drive team has to worry about. And it's something that has to be very precise. And so you don't really want the drive team to have to align each wheel perfectly before each match starts. So the extra encoder that we have on the azimuth motor is an analog device. Um, it is similar to a potentiometer, although Tag was saying that it is actually a, uh, it's actually technically what's called a Hall effect sensor inside of the little box. Um, Hall effect sensors also use magnets. I have to go back and look at the spec sheet to see exactly how that one operates. Uh, whether it's a Hall effect sensor or what's called a potentiometer, the functionality of the sensor is identical. Basically, depending on the angle that the encoder is set to, the electrical resistance from one end of the sensor to the other end of the sensor changes. So your resistance is very low at say zero degrees and very high at uh, 360 degrees. And when you go back to zero degrees, you now also have a low, um, a low electrical resistance. The way that we use that is we apply a voltage, in this case, five volts across the sensor. We literally hook up five volts to one end and then we read the amount of voltage on the other end. And the higher the resistance, the lower the output voltage is going to be. So at one position, um, the encoder might read five volts, and another position, it probably only reads one volt. And at angles in between that, it reads, say, three volts or four volts. So you, by reading the voltage on the other end with one of the analog ports on the RoboRio, you can identify the angular position of the sensor. The really nice thing about that is um, if you turn off the robot and turn it back on again, the value that you read from that sensor is the same. Because it is physically has a different resistance, it doesn't need memory. So um, no matter how many times you cycle the power of the robot, you're always going to be able to boot up and immediately know the true position of the wheels. As a result, the drivers do not have to um, reset the wheel locations before each match. They can put it down uh, theoretically in whatever orientation they want, and the robot will figure things out from there because it will read the correct value. Um, any questions on the difference between those two encoders or the two different drive, the two different motors that we've got? Okay. So, Ethan, I see you hanging out on here. What is the disadvantage of using these types of encoders? And what did we do to fix it? I don't remember, Luke. <laughs> okay. Uh, Amelia wired them, or wired the first one. Uh, does Amelia remember? No, I don't. <laughs> okay. Oh. It, it was December. <laughs> I do remember, actually. 
What do you say, Ethan? Um, isn't it with interference? It is with interference. The aluminum foil. Mm -hmm. Alex, do you want to talk about that at all? Okay, so there's like something to do with like how direct, direct DIO something. Those ones are either zero or five volts, but when the analog ones, if they like touch stuff, they mess up and it's zero, like it's not or, it's like everything in between. So like if it brushes up against stuff, it like doesn't have a happy time. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. So um, let me draw that for you guys. So, and maybe this is also saying, you know, we can also talk about if we want to talk about some electrical subjects too. Um, <clears throat> we can set up some sessions on electronics and pneumatics. Um, so I'll just give a, a brief intro here. So if we have this little plot and on this axis we have voltage, this is sensor voltage. And on this axis we have time. So it's just how the sensor voltage changes with time. And let me draw, we've got, uh, let's see. We've got zero volts. And then up here we've got five volts. Got five volts. Uh, let's see here. I'll do that. Okay. So there are two, there are essentially two types of sensors that we are using. One that's called a digital sensor and one that's called an analog sensor. So um, digital sensors are, or digital signals in general, are typically considered to be more modern. And they're what allows us to have very high data transmission rates um, between devices. That's how we're able to send lots of data. And the way they function is they are either off or they are on. So you would have a period of time where it's off and then it would go straight to zero to five volts for some period of time and go down. And then maybe you'd have some pattern of pulses from zero to five volts, okay? And the information that you care about is stored in the pattern of pulses that you have. So it would, one, one of the terms is you would encode the information that you care about in these pulses of information. And so that is digital. Okay. If I can change that call. The other option is an analog sensor with it uses an analog an analog sensor, an analog signal. And those values or those sensors store their information um, as the actual voltage. So the value being output by the sensor at any given time is its actual voltage. So here, zero volts means something, two volts means something, four volts means something, five volts means something else. Okay, so that is, that is an analog. Okay. There we go. Okay. Now, the other reality is these data get sent on wires, physical wires on the robot. And um, we probably should talk about this in a different session in more detail, but um, as electricity moves through a wire, it generates a magnetic field. The inverse of that is also true. If there is a magnet magnetic field that is changing, it generates electricity inside of a wire. This is the fundamental principle for how motors work. You generate um, uh, uh, electricity in a motor, you get a magnetic, you put electricity in a motor, you get a magnetic field that oscillates. And then if you spin it backwards, like with your hand, uh, you will have a moving magnetic field that generates electricity. And now your motor is a generator instead of a motor. So that's why the robot can turn on when you push the robot really fast. Um, the downside is that's really great. That's how all of electrical generation works for the world. The problem with that is we have lots of things on the robot 
and other robots near us that generate magnetic fields, particularly the motors, right? The whole point of the motor is that we're generating moving magnetic fields. And those magnetic fields are inducing electrical currents in our wires, including our sensor wires. And so instead of having really clean signals like this, what you really have is some amount of noise always sitting on top of your data lines. And as you run, the, as you spin up the shooter, or as you move the wheels or do anything like that, that noise profile changes and it can be better or worse. In a digital signal, this isn't so bad because as long as the value stays kind of close to zero and this value stays kind of close to five volts, you still know that this is off and this is on and you can still count your pulses and you still receive your data cleanly. In an analog sensor though, any noise that is on that data line actually changes the value of the data. It actually changes the value that's being reported to the computer. And so as things happen on the robot, the position that's being reported by the analog sensor is going to change even when the real position of that sensor is not changing. And that's going to make the swerve drive difficult to control because it doesn't have a reliable measurement. Um, one of the ways that you can fix this is, there's a, there's a number of ways, one of the ways you can fix this is with shielding the wire. Basically, you put another piece of metal around your wire so that magnetic fields induce electric current in that piece of metal and don't penetrate to the metal in the signal wire. Um, there are very fancy ways to do shielding, uh, which work great. Um, we did a really simple one, which we just took some aluminum foil and wrapped the wires. Um, at some point, because it is an amount of weight, we should look to see if we need that or not. Um, we didn't have enough time to independently test the swerve drive both with and without uh, the aluminum foil to see if it was making a big enough difference to improve things. Um, uh, we just went ahead and did it because we were running out of time and we knew this could be a problem. In the future, we should look at a test case of no aluminum foil, aluminum foil, and then um, professional grade shielding and see if we get any improvements, um, if there's a, a worthwhile improvement between the professional grade shielding and the aluminum foil, or if we just should, we don't need shielding at all. So uh, we should at some point look at all those scenarios so we understand uh, what the best approach is. Um, are there any questions about the encoders or analog signals versus digital signals? Okay. Uh, so let's see. The last thing to mention here is one second. Is um uh, the uh, the other sensor that we need to control the robot. So with a swerve drive. And so the other one that we've got here is we need an inertial measurement unit or an IMU. Um, an inertial measurement unit basically measures angles. Um, and so this allows us to know the robot's angle with respect to the field at any given time. Uh, we'll talk about it later on, the difference between controlling the robot in robot-centric versus field-centric. Um, but the gist is, in field-centric mode, um, pressing forward on the joystick always moves the robot um, forward down the field. Pressing left always moves it left, and pressing right always moves it right. This is a much more intuitive or a much easier way to control a swerve drive than other methods, um, but it requires us to have a measurement of the robot's angle at any given point in time. And for that, we need the IMU. And uh, we'll talk some about the limitations of an IMU as we get to that, that point in um, uh, the workshops. Uh, are there any other questions about the sensing or uh, any of the hardware associated with the swerve drive before um, I go on to some of the code stuff? Okay. So what I'll do, because I don't want to start the swerve map, there's only 15 minutes left, 
Um, I'll just show you where the swerve is in the code and talk about the PI, do a little bit of review on the PID algorithm. And um, if we have time, I'll talk about uh, sensor calibration. If not, we'll leave that for a different, a different time. So let me go ahead and open up robot project. So control for <coughs> the drive motors on the swerve drive is pretty straightforward. Uh, each wheel has a power that's going to be determined by the determined by the math that we'll work out later. And it's getting sent directly to each one of the drive wheels. There are advantages to doing a more complicated approach where instead of applying a certain amount of power to the the next most advanced, next advanced thing would be instead of applying a certain amount of power, apply a certain amount of power that is scaled by the battery voltage. That way, as your battery drops, the motors respond in a more consistent way or uh, to how they were with the higher battery voltage. The advantage of this, this isn't really, that's not really important for a non-swerve robot. For a swerve robot, that is a bit important because um, you are merging instructions about how the robot should translate with how the robot should rotate, and that's what we're going to talk about. And the merging of that information relies on power being directly related to robot to wheel speed. And that is not strictly true. And so as the battery changes, the behavior of the merging between the robot's rotation and the robot's um, uh, translation will behave differently. The next, the even better solution is that instead of applying a certain amount of power, you apply a target speed and have a PID and a feed forward controller that maintains the wheel velocity so that you're setting a goal velocity because what we'll find is that the, um, the mass that we're going to work out today or next, next lecture is not giving a it's not really giving a goal power, it's giving a, uh, a goal velocity. And um, when you give it a goal power, it, 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 when we're giving it a goal power, it is assuming that, you know, if you increase the power by 50%, you've also increased the wheel speed by 50%. And that's not actually true. The, the wheel speed and the, um, uh, uh, the power that's being applied to that wheel is not a linear relationship. So that would improve the wheel performance. Um, we are not doing either of those two methods. So we're still using the most simple method for controlling the wheel speed on the swerve drive right now, which is direct power application. So uh, right now the code's pretty simple for that, but as we look in the future for improving the reliability and the controllability of the swerve drive, we can talk about some more advanced um, speed control uh, algorithms. Um, control of the azimuth angle the azimuth motor is a little bit more advanced. We do need to use a PID controller to control the azimuth angle. And so our inputs are a, uh, for right now, treated as a angular distance that you have to travel. So instead of giving the PID, um, saying that the PID has to go to position 30 degrees or position uh, 180 degrees, we're instead saying that the wheel currently has to spin positive 30 degrees or negative 180 degrees in order to get to its goal. And so if you look at the PID um, block here, we've done something a little bit unconventional and we're not quite using this properly. Um, we can talk in more detail later about why it is still working, but um, our goal is actually always zero. And our process variable here is this angular distance. So um, the PID is trying to drive the angular distance between its, its current position and the, the real goal to being zero, which is the goal of the PID algorithm. So 
instead of putting in the, the angular position goal, the, the, the real goal, it says, in other words, um, let me explain it this way. Let me draw it out. Maybe that will help. So if you've got your coordinate system here and the uh, robot angle is currently at, we'll call that, um, uh, we'll call that 20 degrees because again, this is at zero degrees there. Um, and where we're trying to point the azimuth module is down here at uh, 100 and, um, so we said that was 20. Uh, we're trying to point it at, we'll call it 160 degrees. Instead of putting 160 degrees into the PID block as the goal, instead we'll do the distance between 20 degrees and 160 degrees, which would be 160 minus 20, which would be 140 degrees. So it's saying that um, uh, the current error is 100, and the, the robot has to move its wheel 140 degrees in the positive direction in order to get from where it is at currently to its um, goal location. Does anyone have any guesses or remember why we can't just give put 160 degrees into this into the goal and uh, put the encoder value into the process variable while we have to do this angular distance uh, uh, portion for it? Because angles wrap around, so um, we might have so the angle values that seem far apart because they're close together on the circle are not. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. So um, you know, if you calculate if our goal angle was that one instead, so it's 340 degrees, the angular distance between 340 and 20, like the, the robot should move that wheel from 20 to 340 in this direction. Um, but if you were to do 340 minus 20, uh, you would get um, a, a much larger number, right? You'd end up with 320 degrees of travel. And so the, the wheel would actually spin in the wrong the wrong direction for longer than it needs to. And the PID algorithm code just does a simple subtraction. So it just subtracts um, the goal from the process variable. It doesn't handle angles well. And so we have to have a separate block um, that does handle all of the oddities with working with uh, angles where the angle wraps around from zero to 360 uh, where 180 and negative 180 are actually the, or 180, sorry, zero and 360 are actually the same uh, angle, where you might have angles in as 180, or uh, you could also measure this from like zero to 180 and um, uh, uh, zero to negative 180. So you have a lot of different sort of options for how you define the angle. And so we do have to do that math before we get to the PID. Um, and that's one of the other things that we'll talk about is how that math actually works. Um, but for right now, that math is done beforehand and, and put into the PID. Does anyone have any questions? Not necessarily with how we've been solved out, but just with the, the concept of why that's a, a problem um, for calculating the, the calculating the values that we need for the PID controller. Okay, and then. Last question we have on the PID is, let's see, Oops. if we look at the values here, you'll see that we have a KP of 0 0.005, and then we have zeros for KI and KD. Can anyone remember why for the swerve drive, we aren't using either the integral or the derivative term? That's because we have a lot of internal friction, so it does kind of act as the derivative and we don't need to code that in. Yep, correct. So we've already got real friction that's doing the damping physically in our system. So we've been able to get away without a D term. And then the reason we don't have an integral is um, A, the motor actually does a very good job of getting the, um, the wheel to the correct position. The, Inertia of that wheel, the mass of that wheel, is fairly small relative to other things that we control like an elevator. And so your steady state error tends to be pretty low. Uh, the other challenge with tacking on an integral in the integral component to this 
is because our goal is always changing, um, the driver is always moving to different locations, most likely the integral would never really come into play uh, because we'd be constantly resetting. Our, the integral would no longer be meaningful because the accumulated memory of the error isn't really accurate because our goal is constantly changing. So we would end up with a lot of lag in how we remember the steady state error um, as the driver tries to, to drive. And so we'd end up with, with lag in how the, um, the, the wheel, the wheel um, changes position. Are there any questions on, well, I'll say, are there any questions on 